Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. If you're looking for the online information session and update about the sewer conveyance project, you are absolutely in the right place. Uh, my name is Colleen Dane, and my role today is to help facilitate uh, this presentation and the Q&A portion that's going to follow. Um, helping me today on the technical side is Ingrid Sly from the CBRD. Thank you, Ingrid, for being here. Um, our goal with this webinar today is to provide you with an update on some of the plans for the sewer conveyance project and some kind of updates to those uh, plans that the project team wants to be able to uh, relay to you. And we also want to give you an opportunity to ask questions of the project team and, and get some information on what's coming up next. Before I dive into the introductions and uh, the content, though, I do want to pause and acknowledge that we are hosting this online session and many of us joining this online session from the traditional and unceded territory of the Comox First Nation, who are the traditional keepers of this land. And we're thankful to work and live here. Our presenter today will be Charlie Gore, the manager of capital projects from the Comox Valley Regional District. And also joining us on the panel to help respond to questions from the CBRD is James Warren, the acting chief administrative officer. Mark Rutten, the General Manager of Engineering Services, and Chris LaRose, the Senior Manager of Water and Wastewater Services. We expect our presentation to take about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we will open up the Q&A session for the second half of our hour. We definitely have the expertise here to help uh, answer any questions that are on your mind, so I encourage you to post them so that we can get you the information you're looking for. Before we dive into that update, though, and that conversation, uh, a couple housekeeping items I need to cover off before we really get going. Uh, the first one is that using this webinar format, we collect questions from you as participants using the Q&A tool uh, through Zoom. So in the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a black bar with a series of icons. One of them says Q&A, and if you click on that, a new window will pop open and you can type in your questions there for the panel. Uh, there's a little box beside it that you can check if you wish for your question to be posted anonymously. And if you see other questions that you think are really important, you can upvote them by adding, um, clicking on the little thumbs up below it, and that helps us understand um, questions that are particularly important or popular for the group here today. We do have the goal and the intention of trying to get to every question that is posted, uh, but should we run out of time tonight, we will follow up with additional information uh, to address those questions that are left outstanding. So I encourage you to post your question, even if we're coming to the end of our time together, uh, because we will be able to follow up and it's a good way of being able to get the information you're looking for. Uh, you may have heard that our session is being recorded today. This is so that we can post it and share it with others to be able to um, see it if they weren't able to join us on this uh, lovely evening, um, but also for you to be able to go back and take a look at it again if there's some information you want to revisit. Uh, it'll be posted in the next day or so. And then finally, if you're having any technical hiccups while participating today, we encourage you to post it in the chat. So this is a different window than the Q&A. Um, Ingrid has just shared her contact information there, uh, and she'll be able to help troubleshoot as best she can from a distance uh, to be able to address any uh, challenges that you're having um, uh, as we move forward for our evening. So with that, um foundation i think we can go ahead and get rolling on the really important stuff so thanks again everyone for joining us today with that i'm going to hand the mic now over to charlie gore charlie over to you yeah thanks so much colleen that's a a lovely introduction on a on a lovely evening so uh as as colleen mentioned this is the second of our of our uh, presentations and so this is going to be very much a duplicate of the the presentation that we presented earlier this month. So unfortunately, you can even see that I haven't updated the date here as, as June 8th. Um, and so um, for those that were on the <clears throat> in the presentation uh, on June 8th, I, I, I welcome any questions that have come up since then. Uh, but there is going to be a bit of a rehashing of the information. Um, so my role at the, at the Comox Valley, Valley Regional District is the manager of capital projects for water and wastewater. And so for those that are, are more familiar that are familiar with this project over several years. You may be uh, more familiar with, with my boss, Chris LaRose, who's the Senior Manager of Water and Wastewater. And the reason that I'm taking over in this presentation today is that this project is transitioned to the execution phase of the project, where 
we take all the planning work that's been done and the, the option that's been selected and we get into the, the, the nitty gritty details and the engineering and the procurement for, for that option. But for, for starters, I'd like to uh, start with, for those that aren't as familiar with this project, how we got to, to this project. So back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, um, the Comox Valley Regional District installed the, the sewer conveyance system. And that sewer conveyance system has, has been relatively unchanged since that time. And it has a, a pump station in Courtney, a pump station in Comox, and a force main that generally runs along the foreshore and round out to the exposed section of the beach along the Willamar Bluffs. And over the last 10 years, <clears throat> that section of the force main has become increasingly exposed and is at, at very high risk, well, is, is at risk of, of, uh, of damage. And when a, a, a critical pipeline like that, that's running with raw sewage is at risk, we really need to do something about it. And so there's been many projects over, over the years to shore up that force main to keep it safe while we come up with a project to replace it. You can see here in the middle photo, we put in gabion baskets, which are uh, wire mesh um, uh, cubes full of rock to protect the pipe so it's not hit with any driftwood in big storms. We've also done a lot of risk and condition assessments on that pipe, digging down to it and also running equipment within the pipe to analyze the, and assess the pipeline to make sure that it, it, it can um, carry us through to getting this project uh, completed. But the urgency to complete this project is very real because the impact of if, if this system were to fail it, it is very significant to our, to our environment. So as I mentioned, this project has gone through many iterations, but the most recent iteration started back in early 2019 when we started a liquid waste management planning process. And that process gathered a technical advisory committee full of technical experts and a public advisory committee, which, which included members of the public that were represented from all the different areas around the Valley to, to bring them together to look at uh, coming up with a solution. And so what they did to start that is they looked at all the different ideas they could come up with of how to get the sewage from the municipalities out to our wastewater treatment plant. And they came up with actually 11 major ideas of how that could be done. And those were summarized and shortlisted into, a, into these five options identified in March, 2019. That was taken through a, an exhaustive process. And from that list, a short list of three specific projects were come up, were, were created. Uh, a year later in early 2020. And then an extensive public consultation, public consultation process, as well as uh, further technical evaluations, came up with a preferred option was selected by our sewage commission in early 2021. And that was a completing the entire project as a single phase, as a single, single construction project with tunneling, uh, op with um, optimal tunneling, which, which meant tunneling through the Lazo Hill area. And which you can see here on, on the graphic, you can see over in the left of the graphic, the Courtney pump station. And then there's, there's also a small pump station within IR1 in the, on the Com Comox land. And then the Jane Place pump station, which pumps all of Comox's sewage. And the, the uh, solution that was come up with was a cut and cover through a long dike road, through IR1, through the, through the municipality of the Comox, of sorry, of the town of Comox, and then a tunneled solution through the Lazo Hill area before heading out to the plant. And that's that's at the time when the project was handed over from the planning process to the execution phase to my team to take that to take that uh, proposal and take it through to implementation. So do the detail engineering on it and go through procurement, get some contractors on board and go out and build the project. And so this is a bit of a, a further level of detail to the Lazo area. You can see that the tunnel was, was uh, designed to start at the, the Torrance and Lazo intersection and to, to go in an arc through the area to try and avoid the, the, the drinking water wells in the area and to come out on Moreland Road, at which point it would go back to a, a cut and cover, a trenched installation out towards the treatment plant. Now, a lot of engineering was done on, on that design 
And unfortunately, as we got into the procurement process to work with contractors to try to secure a contract, there, there was significant risk and challenges came up with the tunneling through Lazo Hill due to the aquifer elevation and the topography of, of the Lazo Hill itself. And as we progressed uh, through that, that design, we, we looked at, had to look at other options to try to solve that problem. And this is a, a rather complicated flowchart, but uh, we've included it today to try to uh, show um, the public the extensive process that we went through and how we've come up with changing the, uh, the construction methodology through the area. So as I mentioned at the end of, sorry, at the start of 2021, at the end of the planning process, we came up with this optional tunneling design. And at that point, we went into the indicative design process where we looked at uh, the Courtney pump station retrofit, which was the original plan, as well as uh, starting to monitor the aquifer and look at the, 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 uh, the detail engineering of how a tunnel could be done. Two items came up through that process. One was that the Courtney pump station is not seismically uh, stable for a large earthquake. And therefore, unfortunately, we need to build a brand new Courtney pump station as part of this project. We can no longer plan to just retrofit the existing pump station. That was one of the major uh, items that was uh, one of the reasons why we went for this trenchless option versus the open cut. The second, as I mentioned earlier, was as, the, as we monitored the aquifer, we, we realized that we could no longer put the tunnel as a gravity line above that aquifer um, due to the, the height of the aquifer, as well as the overburden pressure and the topography of Lazo Hill. And that unfortunately really increased, increased the risk of doing a tunnel through the area. And so that, uh, that led us to really reevaluate one of the other shortlist items, which is open cutting through Lazo Hill area. And once we had resolved the Courtney pump station and looked at some optimal uh, design changes, we were able to show that standard uh, sewage pumps that we use throughout our system right now can be used for that open cut design uh, over Lazo Hill. And with, with the, the reduction in risk, of the, the tunneling that was realized through the, the trenchless option, it was seen as a preferred option to go for the open cut uh, over Lazo Hill. So that was how we got to this change in construction methodology through the area. When we took this, uh, when, we, when we compared the two options uh, against each other, uh, the cut and cover option over Lazo Hill is the least costly and lowest risk project to actually uh, install. It requires us to increase the, the diameter of the pipe, but we're only increasing it by four inches, which is a very small amount uh, to reduce the pressures on the pump stations. It has a similar cost over the entire infrastructure lifespan. We acknowledge that we're, we're pumping the sewage up and over a, a higher height of land. So there is an increase in energy cost, but it's very much uh, offset by the reduction in the project risk and project cost uh, in the initial uh, installation. As I mentioned, we're able to use those standard non-clogged non pumps at a higher pressure, and we're able to, to reuse the existing Co Comox pump station on Jane Place, which is a, a key uh, constraint on the project because we don't have space to build uh, a, new pro a new pump station in that area. It also created a, a very large opportunity, and that's to avoid crossing a new crossing of Lazo Marsh. So, the with the original trenchless design, we were open cutting across the La Lazo Marsh at the end of Moreland Road. With the, with the change in design to going up and over Lazo Hill, we actually have enough hydraulic pressure to go the long way round. Uh, as, as you can see here in this graphic, we, we're, we have the hydraulic pressure to go the long way round and cross Lazo Marsh at the existing, um, at the existing crossing of the mark. Oh, the existing crossing of the marsh on Lazo Road. Uh, what we did when we, when we changed the methodology through the area, we looked at three possible options to get to the plant. We looked at uh, going down Curtis Road, uh, so continuing to travel down Lazo Road and turning uh, on Balmoral, Moreland, and then onto Curtis before heading up to the plant. 
we looked at going down Moreland Road and linking up with the original alignment and crossing Lazo Marsh in, its, in our original planned crossing. And then we looked at this longer way around. And you can see here that the two high risk areas that were just not viable uh, when, we, when we got into the analysis were the steep areas along Curtis Road, which were geotechnically not stable to, to build a, a long-term infrastructure project along. And also the, the crossing of Lazo Marsh, which is a, would be a large environmental impact because we would have to uh, uh, cut trees down in the alignment of that pipe. And so we, when we took this to our sewage commission, they recommended going, even though it is slightly more expensive, as you can see here in the, in the chart, that it's a couple of million dollars more expensive to go the long way round. It was decided as the recommended option to go that Lazo Brent route because of the uh, the seismic resiliency to make sure that this system, once we built it, <clears throat> it will hold up against a large earthquake and last for that full lifespan of 80 to 100 years, as well as to, to reduce our environmental footprint of the project, which is one of our key strategic drivers uh, at, at the CBRD. And so on June 6th, our sewage commission uh, confirmed that Lazo Brent route as our preferred route, but we are still doing some evaluation of that route. We need to do some geotechnical work down on Lazo Road, where we cross the marsh to make sure that it is safe to put that pipe in in, this, in that location without impacting the aquifer below it, because we are very low in that location. So there is some geotechnical analysis that is still being done, and we are still keeping the Moreland Marsh alternate route as our backup. It's we we very much prefer to go uh, the the longer way round, but if there's no safe way to get across that marsh, then we will be reverting to that alternate route. We also need to do some significant review uh, and amendment of the groundwater protection policy. That was an important uh, document uh, when we instigated the the tunneling through Lazo Hill to assure the public in that area that we were uh, committed to protecting the groundwater in the area. And with this change of methodology and construction, the, the clauses and the, the wording throughout that uh, existing policy need to change because it needs to um, reflect the revised design. And so CVID is initiating that process now of evaluating uh, that policy against the new uh, design and how that new design will be operated. Uh, and we'll be working with our sewage commission to amend that policy and we'll be coming back out to the public in the fall uh, to present the revised version of that. To give an update to, to you all on, on where we're at in the procurement process, we are uh, close to closing the design build procurement uh, this summer. And so uh, that will result in a contract being signed this fall, as well as we are separately procuring the contractor for the, the section within the town of Comox. And that, and that procurement will happen this fall as well, such that all the contractors will be on our team by the end of the year. One thing I, I did wanna mention was, was traffic. Uh, we, we've, we've done a, a large amount of work uh, along the rest of the alignment with a traffic strategy, uh, because we understand the significance of the impact of this project to local residents. And so we need to update that, that strategy as well for this revised alignment and revised construction methodology. I did include this one slide because we do have some major advantages in this area. I, I've uh, highlighted every uh, intersection along the revised route and those shown in green have more than one uh, access point for that intersection. So as we, as we build from block to block along this, along this alignment, there are many options for us to divert traffic and, and make sure that people still have access to their properties at all times. Uh, and similar to the groundwater protection policy, we'll be bringing that, uh, that traffic strategy back out to the public for engagement in the fall. Another uh, a key opportunity and, and um, thing that CVID needs to consider over the coming months with the new alignment is the uh, green, Lazo Greenway, Lazo Greenway multi-use path trail project that, that runs in parallel to our new alignment for a lot of the length. So it, it starts here up here at Butchers and La Lazo, 
and follows the, the, the new alignment of the pipe all the way down uh, past the Lazo Marsh crossing on Lazo Road. And so you can see a little snapshot of the design here where the, the multi-use path is actually gonna be off the road um, and in a, a dedicated park parcel. And you can see it's winding through all of the trees within that parcel because the, the intent of that parks project is to nestle the path in amongst the large trees. So unfortunately, we're not able to, to co-locate the projects because we, we, we wanna uh, respect that intent and maintain the trees within that parcel uh, that the multi-use path will be built and the, the pipe will be built within the road. But as that uh, pathway heads further north uh, from Guthrie Road onwards, there may be some opportunities uh, to co-locate as that trail moves to the shoulder of the road. Uh, some next steps uh, on the on the conveyance project, and, and some of these milestones have already have already passed. But just to give uh, folks on the call an understanding of of what we've been doing over the last couple of months and what's coming up. Uh, we mentioned uh, the the change to the new new, new alignment and the uh, sewage commission meetings that we've had to confirm that, and these two uh, public information sessions, which will be followed up in fall with a, a traffic engagement session, as well as coming back out to the, to the public on the, uh, on the groundwater protection policy. From a construction standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, we are um, aiming to have all of our contracts signed and project uh, budget finalized by the end of the year, such that in early 2024, we can come out uh, and have much more detailed plans for the public with regards to actual construction schedules, when uh, equipment will be arriving in each area as we, as we go to build this project, uh, such that we can start construction in early spring. That's, that's it from me today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave up this, this slide uh, while, we, while we do some questions and I'm happy to flick back to slides if, as, as I answer questions, but hoping folks have some time to, to copy this information down. We really uh, encourage folks to, to come to our website. We have an amazing team here who put a lot of work into getting as much information in a very um, understandable format up onto our uh, project website, including all of the questions that came up in the previous uh, webinar, such that we can be as transparent as possible and get as much information as possible out to the public, uh, because it is a very complicated, very large project that we acknowledge has a huge impact. Um, on all the residents of the valley. And so there is a huge amount of information there um, to if there's lingering questions um, that we're not able to address today. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, we appreciate that overview. And um, there, I'm gonna give people a few more minutes and just a reminder about how to post a question into the Q&A window, because right now it is empty. Um, so just for people who are listening in, there's a little Q&A um, box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can pop it open to uh, open up the Q&A window and then type in your question there. Click the box if you want it to be anonymous or add a thumbs up if you uh, see a question that you think is important. Um, and I gave just enough time to have uh, our first question uh, come in. So Charlie, the question is, um, the person's looking to confirm whether or not the existing force main that's on Brent Road would need to be removed um, or replaced or is it being expanded? Yeah, so uh, it, it's a great question because the um, I don't think many folks would know that there is a force main already running down Brent Road. So the, the force main that runs along Brent Road actually comes from a, a different area of the project, comes from our CFB Comox pump station. And that's taking uh, sewage from uh, the base and from kind of the more northern area of, of Comox and Courtney, the, the Crown Isle area. Um, and so we will actually be paralleling that uh, that force main. That force main will remain in the road on Brent Road and we'll be building our new much larger force main. That, that force main is only 14 inches. This new force main will be over 30 inches. And so it'll be a much larger force main and it will be in parallel with that existing force main, which will continue to operate coming in from a different area of the, of the valley. Okay, great. 
Um, and then the next question, uh, I think it references your timeline slide and it asks um, for the uh, public open houses in early 2024. Um, why is there a need to do more consultation about the long-term financing um, piece uh, early next year? Yeah, so in August of 2022, the, the budget for this project was increased. Uh, and that was due to the, the large inflation that we've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, and that has really hit, uh, it's hit many, all sectors, but construction sector and manufacturing especially. So the prices of all of the equipment um, that we're planning to install at our pump stations and the pipes um, has really increased. And so <clears throat> in August of 2022, the Sewage Commission approved a, an increase in that budget. Uh, but we had already gone out for AAP for the borrowing for the project for the long-term approval of borrowing. And so to approve that budget, a, a small amount of short-term borrowing was required to uh, make up the difference uh, in that budget. And so uh, once we have confirmed our budget, once we've closed our two contracts, signed those, and we have a very clear idea of how much this project will cost, we plan to convert that planned short-term borrowing into long-term borrowing because that reduces costs for our taxpayers. So I, I would refer to it as more of a administrative uh, public approval for long-term borrowing. It doesn't affect the ability for the CBID to complete the project. It's more for uh, just ensuring that the borrowing costs that our taxpayers are, are paying as part of their rates are reduced as much as possible. Great. And then the next question is about uh, traffic management planning from a Brent Road owner. Um, they're wondering whether what the, if you have a sense yet about the degree of uh, disruption that they might see specifically, um, you know, will there be any obstructions to travel or access along that roadway um, while the work's being done? Yeah, so I, I want to acknowledge that Brent Road is is quite narrow, and and to install a large pipe like this, there is going to be um, some obstruction along that existing <laughs> route. And so you can see here in my slide, and I and I forgot to bring this up specifically. I, I I'm assuming um, that the uh, the person who's asked the question either lives on Brent Road and is very uh, familiar with it, but there's a fire gate between Brent Road and Curtis Road, and so we would look to open that. Um, while we are doing any uh, work that obstructs uh, Brent Road to make sure that all property owners always have uh, good access to their properties. But it may be um, detoured for a short amount of time as we come along that section with the pipeline. So um, we, have the, we have the great advantage that it's not a dead end road and we have that fire uh, access gate that we're able to open to give temporary, just temporary access uh, out along Curtis Road which feeds out uh, to Lazo, um, but happy to, um, and, and we will be detailing how that will work in that traffic strategy and coming out to the public in the fall to engage on that. And so uh, if there are any follow-up questions or concerns, I very much encourage um, you to reach out to our, to our contact so that we can take that into account when we do our traffic strategy for the area. Right. Um, okay, so kind of as an extension to that question, Charlie, also about Brent Road, the, the concern that's raised is about impact to Brent Road from the ongoing uh, traffic to and from the treatment plant. So would this project include plans to improve or upgrade the paving along that route um, as part of the work? Yeah, so that's one of the, the big advantages. Um, well, the the advantages and disadvantages of having a large project like this happen in front of your house. We, due to the, the narrow nature of Brent Road, it will likely be completely repaved, if not majoritarily repaved by the project. Um, on larger roads like Lazo Road, we will aim to, to fit all within one lane. Uh, but on Brent Road, I believe you'll, it will be a completely repaved uh, road once the project is completed. Great. Okay, I'm going to give it another minute or two to see if uh, somebody, anybody else has a question that they want to pop into the to the Q&A window. Um, maybe, Charlie, you could just flip forward to the slide that has the contact information in case people want to be able to take any other notes. 
Uh, you already gave a good overview of the Engage Comox Valley page, but I would just add to it that also if you go to that page, you can also um, sign up for updates on the project along the way. And so that's a really great way of uh, making sure that you get the latest uh, news as it comes up and as there are engagement opportunities through the planning process and to um, keep up with uh, any updates uh, along with being able to follow up with the information uh, as you mentioned from these events. Um, okay, I'm gonna, there has been no other questions coming in. I'm just gonna kind of give a last call there for questions before uh, we sign off. I don't, I don't blame people for wanting to get back out there, honestly, on a day like today. Um, so seeing no more come in, I will just thank you, Charlie, um, again, for your presentation, your overview. Thank you to the other panelists for being here to address any questions if we had uh, needed, uh, needed your voice. And um, so with that, I think we can all sign off and enjoy the rest of the evening. So thank you again, Charlie. Thank you to the attendees for being here tonight. And we wish you all a good night. A good night. <laughs>